Okay, it is 9.15 and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I wanted to start this morning by sharing with you a joint statement from the officers of the Employee Forum. We, the Employee Forum, as the advocacy body for the university staff employees, stand in solidarity with our coworkers of color and marginalized communities. We are horrified by the continuing systemic racism and injustice that affects our entire community, but disproportionately affects communities of color, especially the Black African American community. The unrelenting frenzy of the past three months to transform operations, to meet changing expectations, to stay connected from the isolations of our homes, to find spaces to be human in a dehumanizing pandemic, and then to bear witness to the pain and suffering of vulnerable coworkers, friends and family, all together is taking a toll. We are weary. Still, as elected delegates, we took a pledge to improve the lives of staff, faculty, and students on this campus, and we do not take that pledge lightly. Improving the lives of our staff, faculty, and students of color improves the lives of all staff, faculty, and students. The Employee Forum asks all campus partners and allies to please open your hearts to this pain that you may not fully understand by pledging to listen and provide loving support. To our fellow staff who are members of the Black African American community, please know that we stand with you in solidarity to fortify your spirit. We will walk with you on this tiresome journey for as long as it takes. Our common welfare depends on unity, and unity is an action word. Let us commit to continue to build our community together through mutual understanding, authentic kindness, and fearless loving support. Love wins, always. And let me add to that, that the world is awash in flowering statements. And so this is our first step. We have decided that our executive committee next week will devote itself to crafting a resolution so that we can make this statement into action, so that we can take the next step, and then the next step, and then the next step, and continue to fight until we finally, finally can say that the statement is working. So with that said, I invite the delegates to please join the executive committee next week and we will start that incredibly difficult work, but so important. Secondly, uh, today is election day. And so uh, our bylaws dictate that we have to um, have the election in real time, which is a little different in the Zoom format. So um, we have crafted a, uh, a Qualtrics, but we need to know if there is anyone who would like to be nominated from the floor or who would like to nominate themselves from the floor today. And we need to know that now so that you can be added to the Qualtrics that will go out later in the meeting. So uh, let me ask that if you would like to be nominated or like to nominate yourself or like to nominate somebody else for either the chair the vice chair, the secretary, the treasurer, or the parliamentarian, please put that in the chat now and you will be added to the Qualtrics that will go out at the end of the meeting. All right. Well, with that, I welcome our first presenter. Uh, welcome, Chancellor Guskowitz. Hi, Shana, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Uh, Shana, thanks so much. It's great to be with you all today. I wish we were together in person, uh, but uh, as, as we know, we, we have been uh, showing up every day at Carolina. You've been showing up every day at Carolina, uh, continuing to work extremely hard uh, for our great university, and I want to thank all of you uh, for that. And uh, Shana, I want to thank you for your leadership, and uh, I, uh, I really uh, enjoyed and support the statement that you just um, shared uh, with the Employee Forum, and uh, you'll be hearing more um, from 
our leadership team uh, regarding action because I, I thoroughly um, agree with you that we need to show action. And uh, I want to start off, I know you want me to talk a bit about the roadmap today, but I want to start off by just saying a few words about the events of these uh, past couple weeks and because it has affected uh, all of us and certainly um, uh, has, has affected uh, uh, you know our, our black community who we care deeply about here uh, at Carolina. And we, our leadership team sent a, an announcement back uh, last Saturday, two Saturdays ago, uh, denouncing the killing of George Floyd. And we thought it was important to add our voices to, to the sadness, the grief, and the anger uh, felt by so many. And it's important that we recognize the pain of these acts of violence, of racism, and uh, the, what it means to so many uh, members of our campus community. And I recognize uh, that we must do more, which is what you were just saying, and we're committed to that. I want to uh, admit that I will probably never understand, fully understand what our Black students, faculty, and staff deal with every day, but uh, we are commi committed uh, to working uh, even harder uh, than we, we have uh, in the past. Uh, I've read a lot about this over the past uh, few weeks, and uh, there's been a lot uh, out there. And one, I think maybe one of the best pieces that I read was from one of our own, uh, Lindsay Ray McIntyre, she's the Chief University Officer at Microsoft. She's a, a, a Moorhead Kane uh, alum, and I had the opportunity to visit with Lindsay Ray back in uh, October out in Seattle at Microsoft because I wanted to hear how she was taking on the issues of, of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And she was relatively new in her role, but I'll tell you, she's quickly becoming one of the uh, leading forces in, in industry in corporate America. And I will say that I think academia can learn from um, corporate America in terms of how they're uh, handling uh, the, this, these issues. And uh, uh, Lindsay Ray's helped us to form some of the ideas we have regarding our uh, vice provost for equity and inclusion position, which is a new uh, position that we're searching, as well as uh, uh, our uh, the role that our chief diversity officer plays here. And I want to also acknowledge that uh, City uh, Anderson Tompkins has done a tremendous job during uh, just these first uh, four or five months uh, in this role and uh, her work is uh, more important than ever and uh, I hope you have an opportunity to spend some time uh, with Sibby. But I want to quote something Lindsay said in a blog that she posted that I, that I referenced that how much I enjoyed reading and she said uh, and it was really addressed to leaders and uh, she, she said it's most important that we create space to listen to members of each community and understand what is needed in moments like this. And she went on to cite a, a close friend of hers who's a diversity and inclusion professional, Megan Carpenter, a black woman, who uh, said, and, and I quote, embrace the discomfort of not knowing, of not being certain, of not understanding, and then be motivated enough to learn and get better. And I think that's what we have to do. And uh, I've shared this with our leadership team and talked about the importance of uh, not uh, assuming that everybody in our community is processing these events in the same way. Uh, Lindsay, uh, in her blog, went on to talk about uh, recognizing the diversity within diversity. And I think that's really important. And asking questions and acknowledging that uh, maybe we fully don't understand, but engaging our, our, our community uh, and, um, and especially uh, asking uh, those of, of, of uh, members of our community who are affected most by this about how how they're feeling and how what, what helping us to understand uh, how we can get better and so we're doing that and uh, we have been doing this but we're really amplifying it right now and so um, uh, I just wanted to start off by sharing that and I uh, we are uh, we want to hear from our community about how we can continue to to address these uh, these challenges so um, I want to shift gears to the roadmap because that, that's what you've asked me to talk about today and uh, we did announce details of the roadmap uh, for uh, Carolina's uh, uh, sort of reopening uh, while I've said repeatedly that we never really closed down because uh, everybody's still been been working really hard and uh, some individuals here on campus uh, uh, even during this pandemic uh, many others uh, working remotely but showing up at Carolina every day and making an impact and so for that I thank uh, all of you and uh, the, the roadmap uh, was really developed over a period of, of about eight or nine weeks. And uh, it's 
uh, has six guiding principles. I just want to walk through them. And the first of those is uh, really that uh, we will stay true to our mission to be the leading global public research university. And whether we're in person or remote, uh, we are focused on accomplishing that mission. Uh, the second point, but uh, first and foremost, above all else, we will uh, you know, ensure that the health and safety and well-being of our campus community uh, is our top priority. And so we're not going to ask anybody to do anything that we don't believe based on the guidance of our infectious disease experts and public health experts uh, isn't safe. And, uh, and that's really my third point is that uh, the, 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 this roadmap has been developed in a very special partnership with some of the world's best infectious disease and public health experts. And these uh, individuals, uh, uh, they're not only helping to advise us here at Carolina, but they're helping to advise the CDC and the NIH and the World Health Organization we're blessed to have uh, an incredible group of scholars who have been studying this for, a, for quite a while. And it, it's also important to acknowledge that, uh, as Mike Cohen has said uh, repeatedly, um, and, and Mike, uh, he is the director of our Global Infectious Disease Institute, that we know so much more about this virus uh, today than we did just four or five months ago. And we'll continue to know more about it in the, in, in the next four to five months. Um, the fourth point is that we're, we, we are focused on delivering the, the very best quality uh, instruction. We're focused on providing in-person options, uh, remote and hybrid instruction options uh, to help support our, uh, our students, and to also have the flexibility that our faculty uh, and staff uh, need uh, to be able to deliver uh, that instruction and carry out our research mission. Uh, we will also have um, a new program called Carolina Away, which will provide opportunities for a fully remote environment for students who just can't get here this fall, our international students and other students who, for, for any number of reasons, they may be immunocompromised or just can't get to campus. And so we're gonna provide that for probably upwards of a thousand, about a thousand students could, could enter that new program. And we have a team working really hard on that. My fifth point uh, is that the, the roadmap will have off-ramps, and these off-ramps uh, uh, will allow us to pivot uh, quickly if need be, if uh, health and safety concerns arise, should there be a, a resurgence of the virus. And so we're working closely with our uh, implementation team. Uh, we're running through uh, tabletop exercises for uh, you know, what that, uh, those pivot points or off-ramps uh, of the roadmap might uh, look like and when they should arise. Uh, so we're, we're, again, we're doing everything possible uh, to try to plan. And uh, we have about nine weeks left until the start of that semester. And so um, we're, we're uh, but again, we've been working on this for, for about eight or nine weeks. And so uh, some people, I think I have to remind people that uh, it was only about 11 weeks ago that we had to make that pivot to, to re totally remote online learning. And a lot has happened in those 11 weeks. But um, but for now, I think everyone knows we're, we're uh, ramping up our on-campus research operations and that has gone really well. Uh, we've been at this now for about 10 days and so far uh, it, it's, it's helping to inform us about how we will uh, ramp up other on-campus activities such as instruction. And uh, so that's, uh, that's going really well. And uh, as you know, we're gonna start the semester early and uh, end the semester early uh, based on the guidance of our infectious disease experts and trying to stay ahead of a, a potential second wave of the virus. Uh, so we'll start August the 10th uh, and uh, we will uh, end the semester with final exams going no later than November 24th. Uh, but again, we'll be prepared if at any point uh, during that semester we have to pivot to uh, a more virtual uh, sort of online environment. Uh, we, uh, this will be a fall like none other in the history of our campus. Uh, as you well know, uh, it's going to look and feel different. Uh, our campus community uh, members are going to need to ad adhere to uh, public health guidelines helping to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we are uh, developing community standards that um, uh, where the expectation will be uh, the uh, regular wearing of, of face masks and uh, practicing physical distancing and vigilance with personal hygiene and, and more. And we have a team that's working very closely on this to, uh, to try to um, put forward the best community standards that will then be um, uh, you know, tested with a, a, a group of individuals that we're beginning to form right now. And uh, Shane, I've reached out to you just uh, the other day uh, to, to join 
uh, that activity. So I appreciate your willingness to do that. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, I know there are a lot of questions around um, working remotely versus working on campus. And I want to just emphasize that we have always uh, worked hard to try to help our employees uh, work in the most uh, comfortable environment, the environment where they, we know that they can thrive and, and complete their work. And we know that some activities, some uh, essential job functions uh, can't happen remotely, others can. And so we're trying to, uh, to navigate this and uh, provide accommodations to those who uh, who need them for medical reasons or medical reasons of their uh, family members and for other situations we're uh, asking uh, employees to to work closely with their managers and supervisors to try to find the best working uh, environment for them but we're going to uh, balance uh, the, the the individual needs of, of our employees with uh, the needs of the, the uh, unit and the campus uh, at large and uh, our office of human resources is working really hard uh, developing uh, workshops. Uh, I know they've been meeting with department chairs and talking through uh, the, the next steps for this. Um, Becky Mangini has developed uh, alongside her team, Link Butler and others, uh, a COVID-19 accommodations and workplace flexibility uh, workshop uh, format, which will uh, be launched soon and it'll provide uh, opportunities for supervisors uh, to, 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 to help guide them about how to work through uh, these conversations. Uh, but uh, I just want to say that uh, we're, we're working really hard at this. Uh, we're also working on uh, trying to maximize parking and optimize uh, safety on public transportation. We have a team that's working closely with Chapel Hill Transit and uh, the um, uh, County Transit Authority to, to do everything possible to provide safe uh, transportation options because I know that is a concern of many. And um, as I wrap this up, and I'm happy to take questions, I just want to emphasize that you know hundreds of universities are faced with the same challenges that we're faced with uh, right now here at UNC Chapel Hill, and the vast majority of uh, universities are taking the same approach that we're taking. The, the majority of them are planning to be back uh, on campus this fall, uh, teaching, learning, uh, working, uh, conducting important uh, groundbreaking research, and um, and so uh, we're not an outlier here. In fact, uh, you know we're we're leading many other universities who are trying to get back to this uh, you know working environment where they can bring um, the majority of their um, community back together safely. Uh, have been leaning on some of um, uh, our roadmap and uh, the experts that uh, have been helping to guide uh, our roadmap. And so. Uh, there's no playbook for this, but uh, we have an incredible team of campus leaders, faculty, staff uh, who have helped us um, to build this roadmap in a collaborative way. And uh, I'm very proud of where we are right now and recognizing that uh, a lot could change in the next three weeks, uh, three months, uh, such that uh, we would need to pivot. But uh, we will need to change our behaviors on campus, uh, but I'm confident uh, in our community's ability to, uh, to do this together. I think we've all seen Carolina's compassion on display uh, even before this pandemic, but I think it's really shined uh, during these challenging times. And uh, we'll need this compassion as we uh, balance those individual needs of, of our um, uh, workforce uh, here at Carolina, and that includes our graduate students as well, uh, with the university's uh, needs a, a, as a whole. And so I just wanna thank all of you for what you do. Uh, to keep Carolina uh, the, this leading global public research university that uh, that we are, and uh, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chancellor Guskowitz. Um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Or if you would like to just ask the question out loud, please go ahead. Here's one. With the additional cleaning needs, do we have enough staff to cover it? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we are uh, working closely with Darius and others. Darius is part of a, uh, a team we meet. Uh, uh, well, I meet with them twice a week uh, on Tuesday mornings and Friday mornings uh, with our EOC team as we're looking at um, what those needs will be. And so um, uh, my, uh, I would anticipate that we're going to have to um, ramp up, um, you know, that uh, workforce. That, and uh, I know that we're working on the uh, developing the, um, the, the advanced cleaning techniques that are going to be needed, sanitation of those communal areas uh, in residence halls, classrooms, uh, 
student union dining halls, et cetera. So uh, there, uh, we're, uh, he's done a tremendous job in, in working alongside our team. And so uh, we will, we'll get to the right place in, the, in that regard. Great. All right. Here is the next one. Okay, they're com coming in pretty quickly. Some institutions have been asking employees to complete training attestations before beginning being able to return to campus. Is any kind of one-on-one -on -one or ongoing self-reporting process in the process for faculty, staff, or students? So yes, yeah, so we have a team that's working on what that re return would look like. Again, we're learning from how we're doing this for our research enterprise that's began this about 10 days ago. And so there will be some type of uh, screening uh, uh, that asked of our uh, employees and students before they return to campus. Great. Next one, how will mask wearing and physical distancing be enforced? Well, again, you know, I've been asked this often and uh, we, this is where uh, this, uh, uh, these individuals that are coming forward to help. We have an implementation team that's working, the roadmap implementation team. And uh, we will uh, be uh, consulting with members of the campus community, just as I've, I've asked you, Shana, to do, and Darius and others. A um, uh, number of that's going to be a, the diverse group that we're reaching out to to help us think about, you know, are these the right standards? I mean, the standards are being developed uh, certainly with our infectious disease and public health experts uh, based on the science. And, and I want to emphasize that that everything we're building out is based on the the latest uh, available. Uh, science. So these are all evidence-based community standards. But then there's the compliance part. And, uh, and so we're going to need to have um, a set of standards that we can say uh, were uh, agreed upon by members of our community, faculty, staff, and students, and that this is the uh, campus, the expectation to come back to campus and work here, learn here, uh, and, and hopefully to thrive here uh, under these uh, uh, challenging conditions. But I do believe that um, uh, this is a community of compassion where people are going to uh, know that that is the expectation and we're working on what the uh, enforcement will will look like. Uh, I mean, I've been asked, can this be a, um, considered for the honor, you know, an honor code uh, uh, expectation uh, and the violation of it if uh, students are, aren't wearing masks and we're, everything's on the table. We're talking with student leaders. We, we have a, a webinar tomorrow. Uh, for students and uh, we're going to get their feedback. I think it's important before we decide uh, what the enforcement uh, and uh, you know what that would look like. Right. Next one. Could you provide the link to the blog by Lindsay Ray McIntyre? If you send that to me, I can send it out. I will do. It's a wonderful piece. I think uh, I've shared it with, with several others and uh, it's, um, it, it's definitely worth sharing. I'll do that. Great. Are there plans for Carolina away to remain available as an academic experience even after the health crisis is resolved? Will that continue as a parallel option for the long term? Yes, so we have been talking about a program like this for quite a while, probably for two years, and uh, because we're trying to find a way to expand our footprint at Carolina, provide more learning opportunities for more people, not just across North Carolina, but across the country, across the, the, the globe. and. Um, so this had sort of been, uh, there have been early stages uh, you know, where we, we, we discussed this and uh, now this sort of caused us to expedite it. And I would anticipate that uh, uh, if it works, uh, this is gonna be more than a pilot run because this is gonna be the, the real deal, if you will, uh, as uh, uh, Rudy Colorado Mansfield is, is leading this alongside Todd Nicolette and um, Steve Farmer. Uh, and it will mostly be geared this year toward uh, first year students most likely, probably some sophomore students because there'll be a number of general education courses. There'll be two learning communities, one focused in global health, another in global business, and uh, that'll allow the, these students to at least matriculate through their first semester uh, together. And uh, we think uh, we'll be able to uh, adjust it, modify it based on the feedback of those students and faculty that'll teach within it this first fall and perhaps in the spring as well. Uh, such that it could be made available then um, permanently. So I'm excited about this opportunity. Great. Will EHS be asked to have training available for everyone as they return so that UNC knows each person has at least seen what is expected? Yeah, so EHS has been part of uh, all of our discussions. They're on these um, 
uh, morning uh, calls with our team and uh, they're part of helping to develop the community standards. And uh, so I, I'll have to, I can't speak to what um, is being planned right now in the way of training, but I think that's a great suggestion and one that we will um, push forward um, uh, with, I'm just taking some notes here uh, that, that we will uh, have to think about. And I'd love to hear guidance from you. And if, if there's an opportunity, uh, whoever's asked that question, if you have ideas, suggestions about how we can best do that to help our employees, uh, I would, would, would love to hear it. Great, we're gonna save the chat. So we'll be sure to, um, to get a copy of that to you. Great, thank you. How long do you have? Because they're coming in. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, let, let me just double check, but I think we're good. Okay. Um, do you anticipate additional guidance coming out surrounding holding events on campus, not just large events like football, but also smaller events such as those host hosted by departments or student organizations? Yes, yeah, so we did announce last week that uh, through uh, July 15th, so if you recall back in, uh, I think it was mid-April, mid, -April, mid uh, Mid, mid to late April, we announced that uh, we would not allow those events up through June 30th. And last week we uh, extended that to July 15th. Uh, and that's really, uh, you know, we're sort of trying to uh, wait to see what the governor is going to uh, allow, if he's going to relax um, some of the restrictions at some point. Uh, I don't know when they'll move to phase three. Uh, but uh, so we'll be announcing that most likely the last week of June, we'll, we'll announce how we're going to handle June 15th through uh, the start of the, the semester on August the 10th. Great. If staff have questions about information on the Carolina Together website, whom should they contact? Is there a place to submit feedback or questions? There seems to be a discrepancy about what staff should do if they are experiencing COVID symptoms. One document says contact your healthcare provider, while another place says to contact the university's employee occupational health clinic or the UNC Health Respiratory Clinic. Well, I, I would just say that for sure you're, I think that they're probably both right, but I mean, I would advise to always, if you're experiencing any symptoms, to first contact your healthcare provider. I, I think then based on the information from that, uh, you, the the second guidance that you recommended to notify your, uh, you know, the, the, the group on campus perhaps uh, such that um, decisions can be made there. So we'll, we'll look at that. I guess I'd, it would help me to know which two, docu the, which two documents are being referenced here uh, such that we could perhaps provide clarification on it. Okay, great. We will look into that and provide that with you as well. Since the pandemic, several staff members across Carolina have proven to be able to effectively complete their jobs remotely. Will this change allow for some staff positions to be remote indefinitely? So we're looking at this. Um, again, uh, we're looking at uh, efficiencies. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are probably some uh, positions, essential job functions within those positions that can be uh, conducted effectively remotely. And so, I, you know, I said um, several times over, over the past uh, two months, three months, that we're gonna learn a lot from this. This was a kind of a forced experiment that we were thrust into because of the pandemic. And uh, I think for the most part, people have been pretty uh, pleased with the way in which teleworking has gone. And, and uh, I know there are a lot of faculty, myself included. I mean, I've been a faculty member here for 25 years and I would have never uh, imagined uh, enjoying teaching remotely. And uh, while I haven't taught a course this, <laughs> this semester, I am actually teaching in the fall, uh, that um, I, I could see how it can, can work for certain types of courses. Uh, there are many faculty though who have said, uh, I, I just can't do this effectively. I wanna be back on campus. We've heard from many faculty that have said that. And that's why we wanna to try to provide options for, um, for, for those that, that really feel the need to be back here. And uh, so I, I think to answer the question, yes, we are evaluating uh, you know, whether or not we can create efficiencies and uh, provide the kind of working environment that maybe is more conducive to certain employees in certain position types. And uh, uh, it could potentially help us as we think about uh, space on campus. We have a lot of buildings that, as you well know, are in need of repair. And, uh, if we, uh, you know, there's been talk of a bond referendum that eventually would allow us to 
uh, to, to finally repair some of the buildings. Uh, that, you know, we have over $850 million of deferred maintenance on our campus. And how would we conduct that, uh, you know, um, uh, those renovations? And, and we'd have to have, find swing space for employees. So it may be that we've learned that uh, a number of, a lot of our workforce could telework while we're repairing and renovating buildings. So again, uh, I think there's some, there are some silver lining to, to, to this uh, that we can, we can learn and, um, and get to a better place. Great. When will the course instruction modes be finalized and communicated to students? So that work's happening now as department, uh, the deans are uh, working closely with department chairs. Uh, the department chairs are working with their faculty to uh, identify which courses will be uh, taught uh, where. And uh, you know, we have uh, made it clear to students uh, and parents that uh, uh, our plan right now uh, is that uh, there will be on campus uh, instruction taking place, but that uh, some of those course courses, uh, even while their students are, are back here on campus, uh, they may have a class or two that's taught in a hybrid model uh, uh, or in, in a remote model. And so uh, we're, uh, we, we think it's going to be important that that can be articulated to uh, students within the next uh, three to four weeks. Okay. There are a couple of questions about masks. Will they be supplied to us and uh, what types will be supplied? Yes, so uh, we will be uh, providing masks. Uh, we have been, uh, procure our procurement office has been working overtime to secure masks and they are uh, securing the, the, the best quality masks that are approved and uh, that, um, that there will be probably uh, different manufacturers, uh, but uh, they will be uh, high quality masks. And, and we recognize that some employees may want to use their own masks and uh, so we'll we're going to be providing guidance on uh, again with uh, David Weber and uh, Mike Cohen and, and others on on what those uh, the, the, the best quality masks are and uh, but they will be uh, provided for those who need them and I would anticipate that most people will want to uh, probably take uh, you know will want to use those masks that we'll be providing. And this is uh, sort of related. What about members of the general public coming to campus to visit, promote their organizations? Uh, for instance, preach in the pit. Will they be required to wear masks? So again, we're working on what that'll look like. Uh, and uh, that, again, the expectation will be that uh, uh, members of our campus community and visitors, that, that, that the expectations will be clearly identified. Uh, and I, I just don't know yet uh, how um, that will be enforced for um, visitors to the campus. This is a public university, as you well know, and uh, it's open to uh, anyone who wants to visit. And so uh, that, that, that will be, um, and it's still left, to, uh, up, we have to determine the, the best way to approach it and enforce it. Great. Um, a couple more. Are you still with us? Oh yeah. Okay, great. Uh, since social distancing will affect uh, many indoor study places, are there going to be made uh, more indoor study places available, such as the Dean Dome, the stadium, or tented areas in Polk Place? So we are talking about uh, l large event-sized tents uh, being put up to help with uh, dissipating some of the um, students, the volume of students that would be in any one place in dining halls, in uh, libraries and student union. And um, I, I do know that other spaces on campus are being considered uh, to help spread that density. Great. And then here, this is actually a suggestion from one of our delegates. Are there plans to provide mask recycling stations? That I do not know. But uh, again, I'll take a note on that. Uh, it, do we know, I, I, would, I would just ask, I guess, is there, um, are there other places that are doing this? And uh, I, I'd be interested in learning more and certainly pass it off to our uh, team that's working on the, the procurement of masks and uh, how they would be recycled. Great. I, uh, I'm, I'm not a very good typist, so I'll just speak. Yes, on the hospital side, there are stations where one can um, get those masks recycled. So if uh, I can get, I can put Shane in touch with those persons and, and move forward from there. That'd be great, thank you. Awesome. I think we made it to the end of the Q&A. Is there anyone else that wanted to ask a question that, that did not?
Okay. Well, I just want to thank all of you for uh, your hard work and uh, we're, uh, we're going to get to the right place with this. I'm confident. And uh, I think, as I said earlier, I just know that we still have um, a lot uh, in front of us. Uh, these next nine weeks are going to be really important, but we have an incredible team planning and uh, we will be communicating uh, the, the, the plan and the changes to the plan as we move forward. So I appreciate all that you do. Great. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, and Shana, thanks for your leadership. It's my pleasure. Okay. Take care. So we are moving on to our next uh, presenter, uh, and it is actually a group of folks, and they are coming to us um, from, uh, we have Derek Kemp, Associate Vice Chancellor for Campus Safety and Risk Management. We have Catherine Brennan, Executive Director for Environment, Health and Safety, and Daryl Jeter, Director of Emergency Management and Planning. Are you guys with us today? Yes. Hi. And Welcome. Hey, thank you. And uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead. Uh, I was trying to scribble as quickly as I could as I was reading some of the uh, questions and stuff like that. So I'm going to jump on a couple of them, and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Daryl. Daryl's on the implementation team and has some uh, uh, insight, some great insight. So one of the quick questions on standards is, um, while standards in terms of enforcement aren't totally defined yet, uh, I'm certainly very anxious that it become a, at primarily a supervisory function, um, faculty function in the classroom, and, and not a police function in the sense that, uh, um, you know, that, that could be viewed as escalatory, especially in the current environment in which we find ourselves. Um, just to, there'll be much more discussion on um, uh, cleaning just internally, but I know that Darius Dixon um, in, from the facilities organization has been looking at cleaning um, um, in very deep discussions uh, since March, and even in terms of what roles is it appropriate, say, to use use a contractor, you know, based on risk and stuff like that. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you heard the question about uh, EHS training. I know you have posted training um, and that you're available to, to support. Is there anything you'd like to add to that question? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, we do have an online general training for the general community about um, COVID, uh, you know, handling how to prevent transmission, um, different controls that you can implement in your workspaces. Um, but that it, it is a general online training. We encourage everyone to take that, but we are also um, available for consultation at, in different units. And we've done that throughout this um, for the people that are on campus. So, um, you know, that's always available as well to have like more of an in-person training that's more specific to the workspace. And then there, for you, Kathy, there was an additional question about um, um, contacting if, if one uh, suspects that they have caught or, or have COVID, the first two steps are uh, OC Health and uh, primary physician is that is that the guidance that you've been yes putting out yeah. there so um you always want to go uh first actually through your primary care um but the employee occupational health clinic is also available and we're about to stand up a wellness check um web application where people can actually go through and check their symptoms and get guidance um just you could log into it 24 hours a day that's going to be launched on Thursday night. Um, so that's going to be another resource. Um, and then it also, you can, uh, you know, if you have questions uh, that you can add in there, the employee clinic will contact you. But definitely if you feel like you have COVID, you should always first go to your primary care physician, call them, um, and they can walk you through whether or not you should be tested. Okay, thank you. And uh, visitors, that was a very good question, and we're working through that. As you know, we get thousands of visitors to this university in terms of uh, students and, 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 you know, potential students and stuff like that. So that's ongoing discussion. Um, the uh, protests or what we call free speech events, 
Yes, definitely looking at that. Um, we've already had a number that either started here on campus um, or started in town and, and, and wandered on campus. Numbers have been in the uh, thousands. Um, we've been as high as I think 2,500, so definitely um, some concern when you start aggregating people like that. And then also just in terms of what the focus may be. In the past, the focus has been on McCorkle Place and the, uh, uh, the monument. Um, very likely it's going to shift. Uh, we're already starting to see some shift of a focus to building names. So a lot of discussion going there. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Daryl, and then we'll go from there. All right. Good morning, everyone. Daryl Jeter, Emergency Management and Planning. We certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate in this discussion this morning. Um, just very generally, as it relates to the COVID response uh, for our campus, it certainly has been ongoing um, since January on the pre-planning and then going into it aggressively uh, as we shifted our campus operations to primarily remote uh, in early March. Uh, and now, given the um, uh, roadmap being provided for reopening in the fall, uh, focusing our attention on providing uh, support for implementing um, and executing uh, the plans of the roadmap uh, over the coming months as uh, staff began to return and then faculty and students um, ultimately uh, by August. Uh, with that being said, um, you know, our, our coordination is not only internal, but we're certainly staying in constant communication and collaboration with our local partners, uh, County Public Health. Uh, we're participating in briefings with them, uh, as well as our town and county uh, public safety and public health partners, uh, as we recognize that this is going to require uh, a collaborative approach uh, as it relates to support services to our campus community um, that um, are, uh, our employees are heavily reliant on uh, we're, we're coordinating with those agencies as well, one in particular being as it relates to our uh, local public transit. And so, um, as was mentioned earlier about, uh, by the chancellor, uh, our transportation and parking uh, is in coordination with and, and collaboration with uh, Chapel Hill Transit and Regional Transit um, to um, uh, identify uh, and, and talk through how they'll continue to provide services uh, while also maintaining uh, safety of those who are riding. We certainly anticipate uh, reducing some of the footprint on how many can ride at any given time and any other uh, safety measures uh, that need to be implemented, um, but at the same token, ensuring that uh, the services are available uh, to those who need it. Uh, relative to our campus, uh, top of mind uh, is uh, community protective equipment in support of our community. Uh, standards for uh, health and safety and uh, under the community protective equipment specifically as it relates to masks um, and what the uh, campus uh, expectation will be uh, regarding masks as it has been in uh, communicated in the roadmap uh, given the expectation um, that that uh, those who are on campus and inside of facilities uh, should be in masks uh, as the chancellor mentioned uh, we are working through the logistics uh, of making sure that we have uh, locations across campus where we can uh, distribute masks to the departments. Uh, so if a staff member needs a mask, uh, they can work through uh, their department to uh, retrieve those um, on some routine basis. Um, and so um, more information will be provided on that process uh, if there are supervisors uh, there, there's already communication out to department heads or directors uh, just to capture some information from them. And so we'll likely see uh, at the department or unit level uh, what we're calling uh, CPE coordinators and, and really our point of contacts uh, to share with us uh, what their uh, demands are uh, for the, the, the quantity of mass within the department and then also to have uh, a schedule of when to anticipate uh, receiving the distribution of those. We are centralizing uh, the procurement, uh, uh, the storage, and the distribution of masks uh, through our uh, procurement and, and uh, central management services uh, on the finance and operations side. And so um, 
those resources will be coming uh, through uh, that that um, source. Uh, but as the chancellor mentioned, uh, we are currently working aggressively to ensure that we have uh, the, the best quality mass to provide uh, as it relates to the type of mass. I know um, if any of you all have um, um, you know tried the various types, um, you know we're looking at the cloth, we're looking at the disposable. Um, uh, we understand that there are preferences on the ear loop versus those that tie around and, and we're uh, being sensitive to that. And then also that uh, some uh, may uh, have uh, unique um, preferences and the ability to provide or bring your own mask, but also ensuring that it at least conforms with some minimum standards of protection and most of that uh, and Kathy can speak more to this, but most of that really surrounds how you actually wear your mask or your face covering. Uh, and so the educational piece around that is going to be pertinent. Also on the implementation side, looking heavily, working with uh, University Communications on signage. And so uh, as you begin, those who will be returning to campus, uh, you, you'll begin to notice in facilities uh, added signage uh, that will speak to uh, public health uh, uh, measures that need to be taken inside of the facility, uh, directional signs just to try to minimize um, the uh, physical contact and maintain uh, uh, physical distancing uh, in workspaces and in areas where you're traversing uh, throughout the buildings. Other areas of focus uh, with respect to the implementation team, I'll just close with this, uh, that you can anticipate um, uh, more color or details being added to uh, the roadmap website as the implementation team um, develops more of the details on operationalizing uh, aspects of the plan. And so we, we really encourage you uh, to continue to use that website uh, as a source of information and updates and the ideas that you have um, uh, based on information that either is provided or may not be provided in the detail that you're anticipating. We certainly welcome you to share or um, um, ask that you share that information uh, through Shana and others uh, so that we can ensure that we're providing uh, timely information to you. I'll pause there and I'll turn it over to Kathy for uh, any other details she may want to provide from more of a public health and safety aspect. Yeah, yeah so I think um... Derek and Daryl have covered a lot of kind of the safety measures that we've implemented. Um, I do want to highlight, you know, EHS um, works closely with a lot of other campus partners to ensure um, workplace safety. So, you know, in terms of cleaning and disinfecting, we've worked closely with facilities. Um, we're working uh, with the signage aspect with the print shop and with facilities for posting. Um, the other piece of that is uh, we do have a relationship with um, Orange County Health Department. So when we do have potential positive cases, we, we are in direct communication with them and we work closely on the employee health clinic side with campus health because um, you know, they're more focused on students, whereas the employee health clinic is focused on employees. So we have a, a good team that um, works together on dealing with these different issues. Um, and the other thing I would like to emphasize, and I think everyone on the employee forum knows that this, is that um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the reopening, but we've obviously had mandatory employees on site throughout this whole pandemic that have had to keep operations going. And we've been involved with those teams from the beginning. Um, I think I mentioned last time there was a question about housekeeping and PPE, and um, we've obviously had enhanced cleaning throughout this. We've worked closely with facilities housekeeping to ensure that uh, those folks are in the correct PPE and understand uh, what safety measures need to take place. So we'll continue to do that as more people come onto campus, um, but I did want to emphasize that uh, we've been involved since the very beginning on um, making sure we understand the best uh, workplace safety measures to put in place. Realizing that this is um, an evolving situation, we do learn every day more about the virus. Um, so we try to keep up to date on that so we can implement um, best practices and measures. And I, I did wanna add, um, uh, we, we spoke about CPE and, and really honed in on 
uh, mask, uh, but did want to just highlight some of the other items that uh, are inclusive in uh, CPE uh, that will be provided to departments. And so, in addition to the face mask, uh, also looking at uh, the hand sanitizer, gloves for spaces that that would be appropriate, uh, disinfectant spray, disinfectant wipes, um, and, um, and, and some other resources as well as uh, we realize that it's going to be a collective effort uh, while our housekeeping staff uh, uh, will be providing some enhanced cleaning in high traffic, high touch areas. There are going to be some personal workspaces where employees will be encouraged um, uh, to uh, ensure that uh, they're doing some added cleaning on a routine basis uh, in those high touch areas in your private offices uh, and other spaces as well. So I did want to highlight that uh, as well. And if you were to ask, um, are you aware it's June 10th um, and we're two months out? Yes, we're, and we're definitely feeling that, that heat. Great. So you guys have been really great about monitoring the chat and I think you've answered all the questions. Uh, there was one suggestion, can EHS training be posted in the well to make it generally known? Uh, yeah, I can follow up um, on trying to get it posted in various places. Right now it is just posted on the EHS website, but I'll follow up on that. Great. And are there any more questions from the panelists or the attendees? Um, I just have a, a quick suggestion. Um, so in the lab, um, we uh, recycle gloves that don't have any kind of hazardous material on them. So there are several companies that do glove recycling as well. Uh, VWR is one of them. Yep, thank you. Um, and I did hear that question about recycling of masks. Um, so I just want to uh, just clarify that they do have to be sterilized before they can be reused. Um, and that is what the hospital is doing. So, uh, you know, we can look into that. Um, but there is a sterilization piece before you can, you know, recycle them or reuse them. There, there is one question that has come up. Are we able to request that our office not be cleaned by housekeeping if that is preferred? Maybe a sign on the door and then I can set my trash outside for emptying. I'd rather clean that space myself to minimize exposure. Yeah, this is yeah, Derek, I, mean, I have seen that. Oh, go, go ahead, Kathy. That's always an option. Yes, you can always request that from facilities um, that you don't want a space cleaned and just set your um, trash or recycling outside the door, but you do you just need to make sure you talk to uh, the housekeeping supervisor for that building so they're aware of it. Okay, any other questions? And Shana, we are available um, as questions come up, you know, later if, if somebody has questions, you know, we're a 24 seven org, just send them our way. I definitely will. Thank you very much. Thank all right. you all three of you for coming and joining us. We will continue to work with you and, and be guided by you. We appreciate your efforts. Thank you very, very much. Hey, hey right. Shana, Thank you. A, a quick note for Kathy. We got an email from the well. They said they'd be happy to post that training. Okay. Yep. I'll follow up on that. Great. And one more quick question. Are there any suggested guidelines to handle cash payments? So the um, spaces, I know I've talked to some um, people like Carolina Dining, for example, um, where they're trying to minimize cash payments as much as possible. Um, but then if they are taking cash payments, that they would have um, their employees and staff in gloves just to, um, and also encourage frequent hand washing. Um, so uh, people are looking at it different ways. If you can minimize cash, as much as possible, that's probably best, but in some instances you can't. So then you would go to PPE and enhanced um, hand washing. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you again. I'm sure we will continue this conversation and would love to have you back uh, as we grow through this process.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the next part of our meeting, which is the Peer Recognition Awards. And I'm gonna hand it over to Natalia Neal and share my screen as she uh, welcomes our Peer Recognition Award winners. Natalia, are you with us? Good morning, everybody. So uh, good morning, colleagues. My name is Natalia. I am uh, an employee forum delegate and I chair the UNC Employee Forum uh, Peer Recognition Awards Committee uh, for this year, 2020. Um, it is my extreme pleasure to uh, present uh, deserving UNC staff members uh, awards each year. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this occasion. You ready to go, Shana? Yep. Are Are you not seeing my screen? Uh, it. Yeah. Okay. So the first award that we'll be giving this morning will be Staff Member of the Year Award. Um, the first of the two categories will be the Hall of Famer, which consistently. Exempl employees consistently exemplify the university's mission of integrity, collaboration, respect, high level customer service, and has been with the university for at least five years. And the second category will be the perfect addition. Um, employees consistently exemplify the university's mission of integrity, collaboration, respect, and high level customer service, and has been with the university for less than two years. Um, so the first award is going to go to, um, Miss Jacqueline Gist. Jacqueline works as the Assistant Director of University Career Services. Um, she was nominated by Chloe Benjamin. Um, and, uh, one of the things that, um, Chloe says about Jacqueline is, Jacqueline is an outstanding colleague who's been with the University Career Services Department since I was a student in the year 2000. I actually remembered her from that period when I interviewed with the department. She is dedicated, she's a dedicated counselor who colleagues and students can rely to work professionally and with integrity. When it comes to working with students, her customer service is, is exemplary. exemplary. Students know her name and she's known to be good at what she does. She works tirelessly to help students, taking students for drop-ins, even when she's not booked for those time slots. Um, I think Jacqueline belongs in the Peer Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Jacqueline. The second award is going to go to Jeanette Goings. Jeanette works as the Director of Nursing and Clinical and Translational Research Center on campus. Her um, nomination was submitted by Ulrich Adam and uh, Jack Jeanette's commitment and dedication to the integrity and validity of research is far beyond her job requirement. Um, Ulrich says he's never seen her take a yearly vacation and or has she uh, never been out on sick leave. She works weekends and extended hours, not only to fulfill her obligations as nursing director, but also she serves as the second clinical nurse when we have patient care past normal hours of operations. So congratulations, Jeanette. So those are our two Hall of Famer awards and the staff member of the year. And now we're going to move on to the Perfect Edition Award. The first per perfect edition award is going to go to Mr. Mark Wample. Mark works as a technical support specialist in the office of the provost. He was nominated. Um, we had several nominations for Mark in different categories, but in total, he was nominated by um, Aaron McDonald, James Mason, Lori Boulder, um, Madison Wood. Eo Kimbaya Winship, Baron Matherly, and Lynn Blanchard. Um, some of the nominations read, Mark embodies what it means to be a Tar Heel. Mark always responds promptly to any questions 
and never makes you feel that you like you're bothering him. He is genuinely tries to explain things in a manner that you can comprehend. So congratulations, Mark. Those are really nice compliments. The second uh, Perfect Edition Award is going to go to Kayla Gardner. Kayla works as the Clinical Education Assistant in Allied Health Sciences. Um, she was nominated by Valerie Tan, and uh, the nomination read, because of Kayla's initiative and or organization, the logistical task of ensuring that all student requirements are met and communicated with sites has become much more streamlined and less burdensome in the time that I've been in this role. I would not want to do my job without Kayla. That's a really nice compliment. Congratulations, Kayla. The next award that we're going to be giving out will be the Professional Excellence Award. This award recognizes Well, actually, it should say four there. Um, it recognizes four deserving staff members for exceptional ex execution above and beyond assigned duties, supportive interactions within their department, supportive interactions between campus department, and or exemplary interaction with the outside community. Um, The first award for professional excellence is going to go to Jarviel Baker. Congratulations, Jarviel. Jarviel works as a professional development and career coach for Honors Carolina. He was nominated by Brian Yakulik, and his nomination reads, in addition to his work responsibility, Jarviel hosts weekly vision workshops to help students with multiple aspects of planning for life after college. He has been instrumental overseeing the Honors Carolina Student Association. He serves as chair for the Carolina Black Caucus, and most importantly, is an amazing person and incredibly deserving of this prestigious honor. Congratulations, Tarvio. The next professional ex uh, excellent award winner is Claire Lorch. Claire is the manager of the Carolina Community Garden. Congratulations, Claire. You were nominated by Laura Menlin, um, and your nomination reads, Claire dedicates more of her time, heart, and energy and commitment to her work than anyone I've ever met. She is an unsung hero of, of the university. She helped create and has been managing the Carolina Community Garden for 10 years. The Carolina Community Garden donates all of its produce um, to the lowest wage workers at the university and they donate over 5,000 pounds of produce each year. So congratulations, Claire. The next Professional Excellence Award winner is Yesenia Vicente. Yesenia works as Program Coordinator in Diversity and Student Success. She was nominated by Kathy Wood. And Yesenia, your nomination reads, Yesenia, Yesenia was onboarded to um, diversity and student success to work directly with our student programming component and has performed exceptionally. She has taken what we hired her for to a much higher level. For example, she's taken it upon herself to learn and shadow the co-directors in terms of campus outreach and is now an integral part of our recruitment and retention efforts. She also goes out independently to represent DSS at orientation and informal events held by UNC. Additionally, she's taken part in broader efforts where we present and share best practices both at UNC and nationally. Really great compliments, Yesenia. Congratulations. And the last Professional Excellence Award winner, the last award in this category is going to go to Tyler Handfinger. Congratulations, Tyler. Tyler works as a Special Projects Coordinator in the Office of University Development. Um, and he was nominated by his supervisor, Catherine Pierce. Uh, Tyler, your nomination reads, Tyler is a junior level teammate who has earned the trust and respect of colleagues of all levels. It will be a wonderful honor for someone like Tyler to receive this type of broad recognition that he so richly deserves. He will be leaving the university this summer to enroll in the MBA program here at Carolina. It would be sing a singular honor and moment for him to be recognized. 
While we hate to lose him, we're delighted that his promise has been recognized by our business school and that his talents will be nurtured and developed right here at UNC Chapel Hill. Congratulations, Tyler. So the next award that we're giving out today is the um, Overton Le Leadership Award. Um, this award honors the memory of Jackie Overton, a beloved and dynamic leader who fiercely advocated for staff while strengthening existing and forging new, relationship, new relationships with numerous campus partners and the administration. The purpose of this award is to recognize and reward individuals who have provided outstanding leadership to their office, department, unit, and the university through involvement in staff issues, committee work, teamwork, professional development of peers, and nominees should be individuals who demonstrate outstanding leadership qualities, inspire and involve others, work to assure that the impact of their efforts in the community campus is lasting, and the, the nominees do not have to be supervisors in order to be awarded this. Um, this award. So the first Overton Leadership Award that we're giving out today is going to go to Shannon Eubanks. Congratulations, Shannon. Shannon works as department manager in, Depart in the Department of Political Science. Um, she was nominated, we received several nominations for you, Shannon, which is always wonderful, by Kim Barber, Genevieve C Cecil, and Allegro Godley. Um, some of the things that you're, um, colleagues have said about you is that Shannon's, Shannon is the best boss I've ever had in my prof uh, professional career and most likely the bo best boss I will ever have. Um, one, of some, one of your nominations reads, for me personally, I've not had a coworker, colleague, friend, or mentor that I like Shannon before. It is beyond important for her to make sure I'm furthering my career or getting training or school credits. She fosters an environment where we want to work hard and get the job done before deadlines, where each of us wants to be proud of us, and most importantly, where we are there to support our chair and faculty to the fullest. Those are all really nice compliments. Congratulations, Shannon. Um, the last award in this category, the Overton Leadership Award, is going to go to Brandon Washington. Congratulations, Brandon. Brandon works as the Director and Interim Associate Vice Chancellor in the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office here on campus. He was nominated by Camille Brooks. And uh, Brandon, your nomination reads, Brandon actively cultivates the skills and abilities of his staff to take on new projects and professional opportunities, seek out and attend professional development opportunities, to support the department's goals as well as our own professional goals. Congratulations, Brandon. The next award that we're giving out today is gonna to be the Pinnacle Award. This award recognizes three deserving, actually it should be two, two deserving staff members for exceptional execution above and beyond assigned duties, supportive interactions within their department, supportive interactions between campus departments and or exemplary interaction within with the outside community. And the first Pinnacle Award that we're giving out today is going to go to Tosca Cooper. Congratulations, Tosca. Uh, Tosca works as a research project coordinator in UNC Injury Prevention and Research Center. Um, Tosca, you were nominated by Patricia Harris um, and your nomination reads, it takes self-reflection and intentional planning to build practices and behaviors that may enhance a commitment to learning. Tos Tosca has been strategic in cultivating and supporting an ongoing commitment to learning, both within her department and the larger Carolina community. Over the past year, Tosca earned four, four professional certifications and participated in five professional development trainings offered through the university. Additionally, Tosca assumed leadership roles as a member of the Carolina Black Caucus executive team and on local boards in the Chapel Hill community. Congratulations, Tosca. The next Pinnacle Award winner is Stephanie McIntyre. Congratulations, Stephanie. Stephanie works as Associate Director in University Career Services. She is a 
our superhero as she places herself on the front lines to advocate for not just those that she supervises. Sorry. supervises, but the betterment of the office. She challenges outdated notions with relevant solutions and empowers us to do the same. Stephanie, you were nominated by several people, uh, several of your colleagues, Tamara Taylor, William Taylor, and Mary Rosage. Um, one of the other nominations reads, when Stephanie joined UCS in 2018, we were in desperate need for a genuine leadership. We were disjoined and our trust was nil. Um, instead of keeping our head, her head down as the newbie, Stephanie rolled up her sleeves and got in the trenches with all of us. She is our superhero as she places herself on the front lines to advocate for not just those she supervises, but the betterment of the office. So wonderful compliments, Stephanie, congratulations. Okay, and um, the next award is our most prestigious award. It is our three-legged stool award. Um, this award um, is awarded to distinguished contributions by an individual who works to promote cooperation and collaboration amongst faculty, staff, and students. Nominees should be individuals who inspire creativity, promote harmony, and partnerships within the university community, inspire teamwork and cooperation and participation, demonstrate new approaches to current processes, encourage, mentor, and build bridges, form alliances to work collectively, or demonstrate any of any other significant community build community building activities. Um, this award is given, um, we also um, give out a three-legged stool. It's an actual stool that's engraved and um, the engraved with the recipient's name and the following statement, awards that people receive are not just for them, it's for all the people who make them look good. So this is gonna go to Jackson Co. Um, Jackson works. I'm so sorry, my, my house phone is ringing. Jackson, I'm sorry. Jackson works as the clinical skills testing coordinator in the UNC School of Medicine. He was nominated by Ada Sutherland. And Jackson, your nomination reads, when our assistant director left, Jackson took over the job of managing our, cent our center calendar, working with professors and staff, scheduling events in the center, um, so the medical students could practice with our standardized patients. When our standardized patient coordinators left for other positions, Jackson took over recruiting and training our standardized patients until a new coordinator could be hired. Jackson works night, weekends, and during the week weekend to make sure things are always successful. He does not, does not like to tell anyone no. He's always helping, instructing, and doing anything anyone asks. When COVID hit, he quickly transitioned the skill center into being able to meet, to meet by computers, even going by the office to pick up computers and set them in staff members' homes so that we could work from home. He researched programs so we can continue to teach medical students via computers. I can go on and on, but suffice to say, I'm in awe of his patience and knowledge, being able to deal with staff, um, lead us when our director's not available, and do all of this with an amazing amount of patience and fortitude. Wonderful compliments, Jackson. Um, congratulations on the Three-Legged Stool Award. And just to say a very special thank you um, to the UNC Employee Forum delegates who um, you know, take the time each year. This year we had more than 150, we had 188 nominations. Um, and uh, I know that staff members across campus all appreciate our hard work. This year's uh, 2020 committee members were myself, um, Khadijah Murray, Tiffany Carver, Shana Hill, 
Adrian Chivaliscio, Keith Hines, Kelly Scurlock Cross, Arlene Metter, and our non voting member is Matt Banks, who keeps us all organized and together um, through the, the voting process for all employees. So, this concludes the award ceremony for the UNC Employee Forum recognition. The UNC Employee Forum Peer Recognition Awards for 2020. Thank you all for your time, and I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you, Nataya, and congratulations to all the winners. Um, we have incredible staff all over campus. You're not recognized enough. We do uh, we do our share to try to to try to recognize who we can. You are all wonderful. Thank you very much, and keep doing what you're doing. And we will see you again to do this next year. So we're moving on to the next part of our agenda, which is uh, the consent agenda. Is there a nominate? Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I would like to um, take out the blood drive from the consent agenda, but otherwise, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. The consent agenda is approved. Uh, let's go to the blood drive. So I'm not sure if Jim is on the call right now, but I'm here. Okay. Do you want to give the update? Sure. Uh, we had a very successful blood drive on uh, last Tuesday. We had 812 people presenting and we had 808 units which surpassed our goal of 780 units of blood uh, donated so that was a fantastic turnout we had pretty much a record high for volunteers as well um, we had over 150 volunteers and uh, we kept everybody safe as far as we know so far and everybody had a good idea uh, to partner with local businesses as well for changing our canteen, our food area. So we had Biscuit uh, Sunrise Biscuit Kitchen. Uh, they provided us with a discount. Uh, Merritt's Grill uh, donated sandwiches, and we also bought some from them too. Uh, Insomnia Cookies provided us with a discount, and uh, Med, Med Deli also provided us with uh, donations. Uh, so we tried to partner with local businesses because they were struggling as well and they were kind enough to offer, a, I don't know if they're struggling, but um, I'm hoping that they're not. Um, but we wanted to provide some sort of um, give, we wanted to give back to our community uh, aside from donating blood this year uh, more than ever. So thanks to everyone for helping plan this if and uh, I saw a few of you there volunteering and showing up and donating so thank you very much for that as well so another successful blood drive uh, from the employee forum so thank you thank anyone you, have Jim. any questions yeah any questions for Jim okay thank you Jim and to the entire blood drive uh, committee I know that that wasn't easy to accomplish this, uh, this time around, so thank you very, very much. We are going to be moving on to old business, and that is the elections. So I'm going to turn the elections over to Jen Daniel and Laura Pratt. Good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Pratt. Um, Jen and I are really excited to facilitate this new, exciting electronic voting system. It's very high tech. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is just go through the individuals who have been nominated for um, our open positions and then I'll pass it over to Jen who will describe how we're going to vote via Qualtrics and then we'll do the actual voting. So we will jump right in. Um, running for the position of chair is Shana Hill. Shana did share some remarks with us in our May meeting, um, but Shana, do you have anything you'd like to add today? Uh, nothing uh, that we haven't already talked about. I just am excited to continue the work and uh, the work is very difficult right now and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that we will all unify together and rise to this challenge. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shana. 
Um, we have two individuals running for vice chair. The first individual is Natasha Hanks. Natasha, would you like to share some remarks? Yes, good morning, sorry. Um, good morning, my name is Natasha Hanks. I am currently the office manager and executive assistant to the assistant dean of human resources and staff engagement in the School of Dentistry. Um, although I am new to the University Employee Forum, I'm no stranger to service. I previously worked for UNC Healthcare for six and a half years. And during that time there, I joined many committees. Two of them were the Assistive Personnel Career Advancement Team and the Administrative Professionals Conference Committee. I served as the chair of APCAT and the chair of the decorating committee for the APC. And in both of those roles, I was able to utilize leadership skills attained through professional development, which I acquired here at UNC. I'm eager to use these skills again for the employee forum as well as develop new ones. And joining a new group can be intimidating and overwhelming. So sometimes, um, but I take the approach of diving in and learning as much as possible to help others. For this reason, I've chosen to nominate myself as vice chair for the employee forum. In this role, I aspire to rapidly learn the history, processes, and goals of the employee forum while offering my skill set. I am excellent at supporting individuals, and as a vice chair, I know a big part of that is assisting the chair. I am welcoming the opportunity to do so. So I just want to thank you guys for your consideration. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, thank you so much, Natasha. Um, also running for the position of vice chair is Katie Musgrove. Katie, would you like to share any remarks? So beyond um, the remarks I made in May, um, I don't really have much to add, but I really appreciate your consideration and, and I hope to continue um, in the role of vice chair and continue serving in a leadership role for the forum. I really value um, the, ex the experience in working with each and every one of you. Um, and I, I think that we're gonna do great things as a forum um, this year. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so running for the position of secretary is Tiffany Carver. Um, I know that Tiffany had to run to um, an appointment. Tiffany, are you on and available? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, yes, I am here doing mommy duty at an orthodontist appointment, sitting in a parking lot, <laughs> trying to uh, get good coverage here. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, give me just a second here to get myself together. I did come up with something really quickly. Um, just wanted to say that I appreciate the opportunity to run for secretary again. I've been on the employee forum for several years and have always enjoyed uh, my time serving our fellow employees at this great university. Um, being the secretary of the forum has been an honor and a privilege for me. I continue to grow and to learn new leadership skills and I'm appreciative of how supportive Matt, the other officers, the executive committee, all of you have been. And I've also enjoyed having the support of other delegates and look forward to getting to know our new delegates as well. So I, I would like to continue learning and growing in this position and also continue serving the forum and our fellow employees in this capacity. I appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Running for the position of treasurer is Ayla Acacia. Ayla, are you um, on and wanting to make comments? Yes, hi, thanks, Laura. Can you hear me? Great. Um, last meeting, I talked about my skills and experience that make me a good treasurer. I don't want to talk about that today. Um, I would like to say that my heart is broken about the violence and pain that our country is going through right now and the events that have occurred since our last meeting um, has made me realize that now more than ever, the employee form is vital to the advancement of the UNC community. And regardless of being elected, I would just like to say that I promise to show up, I promise to be reliable, and to hold up our pledge to respect the worth of the individual. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Ayla. Running for the position of parliamentarian is Kevin Robinson. And I'm looking, as Kevin on? I don't know that I see Kevin. 
Okay, so no remarks from Kevin. So just to, to do a quick recap, running for chair is Shana Hill. Running for vice chair is Natasha Hanks and Katie Musgrove. Running for secretary is Tiffany Carver. Running for treasurer is Ayla Acasio. And running for parliamentarian is Kevin Robinson. So what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Jen, who's gonna give you an overview of the election. Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. So the way we're gonna do this is with a Qualtrics survey. The Qualtrics survey in just a few minutes is going to come into your chat box if you are a panelist. So right now all of the forum delegates should be panelists and they are gonna be the only ones who are gonna be able to see the Qualtrics survey uh, because they're the only ones who are allowed to vote. So a few, a few things, you, number one, you must type your name on your ballot. Uh, you're gonna get a link to the survey in the chat box. You can either click on that link or you can put it into a web browser. Um, and we have, to know, we have to have your name on the ballot because the North Carolina general statute requires it. We can't have any uh, secret ballots. And so um, your vote will, like, we're not gonna publish it, but you do have to put your name on the ballot. If your name is not on the ballot, we will not count your ballot. So you must put your name on it. Also, you can select one person for each office or you may choose to vote for no one for any or all of the offices on your ballot. It's totally up to you. Another thing to keep in mind is all of the offices are on um, one page. So there's only one page to this survey. At the bottom of the screen, there's gonna be a blue arrow. When you click that blue arrow, it means you are submitting your ballot. So please make sure that you've done all the voting you intend to do before you click that arrow. Also, please keep in mind, you may only submit one ballot. If you complete more than one ballot, we will throw out all of the ballots associated with your name because we won't be able to know which one you actually wanted us to count. So please check your ballot carefully um, for all of your votes before you submit it and then click the blue arrow at the bottom to submit your ballot. Next, we're gonna take five minutes to complete the voting. At the end of that five minutes, if anyone needs any more time, uh, we'll do another five minutes. Uh, for So for no more than 10 for all the election, it's a very short ballot, you can do it. Um, once, once we come to the end of that time period, we will close the survey uh, so that no one else will be able to vote after that period of time. And I'm going to share my screen so that you can see our, um, our five minute timer. And Katie, I found a less scary timer. Okay, so with that, um, Laura, if you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat box, I will mute myself and start the timer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jen. So you'll see that there's a, a bit.ly link on the chat feature for all panelists. If you have trouble, any technical difficulties, please reach out um, via chat or uh, that's probably better. Just reach out via chat. Finally successful in booking my last leg of my flight this morning. Good Lord. Thank you.
looks like we have about six seconds left. Fantastic. So we're at the end of five minutes. It looks like we have had 55 ballots submitted. Does anyone need additional time or did anyone have any difficulties? James, I see your question. If you can submit that to me privately, I will submit it. Thank you, Natalia. Any other difficulties? Fantastic. Well, Jen and I are going to disappear for a little while and go through and count the ballots up. Um, thank you all for helping this process go pretty smoothly so far, fingers crossed. Um, and we will turn it back over to Shana to continue on with the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to seeing the results. So now we're going to move on to the human resources update section of our meeting. And just a, a quick word about that. Um, the Office of Human Resources has been very kind uh, in working with us at to create some special sessions uh, for human resources updates because they are just coming at us so quickly and we want to try to get that information out to, to campus um, in sort of real time, if you will. So in addition to uh, what we uh, what they may share with us right now, we do have a special session on the 19th and the employee form will send that information out so that folks can attend that um, from a larger community. So with that, um, if Link is still here, I know he had to run to another meeting, but if he's still here and he wants to say something, uh, and then Jessica from Wellness. Thanks, Shana. Um, all right. Still getting feedback? Yeah. I think we're having issues with the audio. Can you hear me now? That's much better. You've got it. Now we can't hear you at all. Great. Okay. So, um, audio issue. There you are. <laughs> Did you want us to move on to Jessica? Okay. So thank you for trying. Um, we will, uh, as I said before, link, we will send out the information to the HR special session and that's on the 19th. Um, and thank you for trying and we'll move on to Jessica. Is Jessica with us for the wellness update? Shana, I saw her on earlier, but I don't see her in the, the list any longer. Okay. So if she jumps back on, uh, then we'll move back to the wellness update. Then let's move on to new business. And we have a proposal to create a woman's issues committee. Are folks ready to present on that? Hi, everyone. Um, so it's just me. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I guess I should have brought others with me to uh, to talk about this. But um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an EHRA non faculty delegate. I work in Wilson Library. Um, so just a little bit of background on this proposal. Um, it, it seems like so long ago with everything that's transpired over the past um, few months. But Early in the, earlier in the year, I was talking to a colleague of mine who is a member of the Association for Women Faculty and Professionals, and she was asking me if, um, if the forum had a, a women's issues committee or caucus. Um, they were doing a survey of organizations, um, staff and faculty organizations on campus. And so that's where this idea really came from. Um, 
And the more I thought about it, um, this association for women faculty and professionals is open to staff, but it requires a, um, a yearly fee. Um, so that's one barrier to joining this organization. Um, and many, many organizations have um, set precedents for um, women's caucuses, women's um, concerns committees. And so this is where really the idea came from whether or not the forum would um, potentially um, be able to hold space for um, women's issues in particular um, as a new committee. And so I put together a very brief proposal um, with some ideas with um, as far as what this committee would do. Um, so some of these things could include um, creating opportunities for networking and social outlets, sharing information um, specific to women's issues and concerns, offer support, both personal and professional, um, organizing programs and events. Um, so this is for practical information, professional development, et cetera. Um, advocate and implement um, policies, um, fostering diversity and inclusion on campus and recognizing the great work of, of women um, on campus. and. So since uh, I started thinking about this and since um, the pandemic and um, uh, the murder of George Floyd and um, so many other things, um, I mean, I would say that, you know, I think that there is an opportunity to potentially uh, rethink this um, as a, uh, an inclusion committee. So a committee really working to implement um, uh, and, and foster a culture around inclusion. Um, and, and so I think that that's an opportunity here as well. Um, and keeping in mind that um, we wouldn't want to um, duplicate work other committees are already doing. Um, and thinking about how um, a new committee like this, whether it's a women's issues committee or an inclusion committee, whether or not it's um, uh, working with other entities on campus. So the LGBTQ Center, the um, Women's Center, um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, et cetera. And so thinking about how um, a staff focused committee looking at these issues would plug into what's already happening on campus um, and all the good work that's already happening. Um, and further, some of these, um, some of the concerns that may be um, held by women, um, our um, staff of color. Um, so that's basically the proposal and the thinking behind it. Um, and and so you all received a very very brief um, copy of some uh, some starting ideas for how this committee could could function um, some of the services that it could provide. Do you want to open it up to some questions and discussion? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to put it back to you. Um, I haven't, so I've um, been a, a member of the forum since last summer um, and so I haven't proposed anything like this before. So just tell me what um, what the procedure is is from from this point forward, um, and I would love to have a discussion. Great. So I'm going to defer to to is Phil still on the meeting because he is a, a former parliamentarian and he can yeah. help us with process. Yeah. So um, so this would technically be the first reading. Um, it's a a chance, um, and I think only because we sort of deferred from the last meeting um, when it was on the agenda. So um, this would be an opportunity for folks to um, ask any questions or add additional um, sort of friendly, uh, constructive criticism for <clears throat> or constructive commentary for you know potential changes to the actual text of the document. Um, since the thing that we um, would be voting on as a body at the second reading, uh, I guess next month. Um, would be whatever is in the text of that particular document. So the words are kind of important if there's anything that strikes folks as being um, too narrow or too broad or um, 
somehow out of alignment, um, that these are, this is the time to sort of raise some of those concerns. Less about copy editing, but more about the sort of sentiment behind some of that stuff. So um, it, we can open up um, for discussion, I guess, if folks want to do that in the chat, um, or Shana, if you're comfortable with uh, having folks turn their microphones on to ask. I'm, I'm also wondering too, um, just for uh, for purposes of clarity, if if someone um, and I've been digging for it, but if someone has the ability to share the text of the document in Zoom, um, it gives us something to kind of go off of. Does somebody have the, the text ready or available? Um, I could, well, I'm not sure I have, I have a copy of it. Um, I know it was in the forum um, yeah. meeting minutes um, <laughs> as a link. Uh, I don't know if I have the power to, <laughs> to share a document. Uh, I don't think you can do that in chat or. Okay, let me um let me see if I can do this. Uh, I have too many windows open. Sorry. And I can make you a um a code. that? Great. Yeah. Um, if that looks small, I can uh, adjust the window and whatever else. Yes, and I will say um, again. I mean, you can see that I've I dated this as April twenty first, um, and really, I had, we had started thinking about this earlier in the year. I mean, it's very brief, um, and and so there's a lot more that can be said or added or changed. Um, and it, and again, so much has transpired since um, since April twenty first. <laughs> um, but I do think that this is. Um, a, an opportunity um, to maybe think about um, the ways that we could implement um, uh, and really work uh, to uh, to think about what diversity and inclusion really means um, on campus and among staff and to have space um, to really, really focus on on some of these issues. And so I I think that it's, um, you know, while we sort of envision this as a women's issues committee, um, if, if we as a body decided that it would be important to, um, to maybe build off of this, we could, um, I think that it, it would be great to have, if we did change it to have an inclusion committee um, to really, really focus, because I feel like inclusion is, is a part of, a culture. Um, it's it's a way of living and it's a way of working and and interacting. So, really focusing on on inclusion um, because we are certainly um, very diverse, inclusive. Uh, that I see the chat inclusive excellence. I think that that's that's a really exciting way to put it. Great. I know we had some discussion about that in the executive committee, uh, and I think that's. I think that is a great new committee to have. Um, I'm, you know, I, I feel like we're late to the game, actually. And so I would love to see this move forward. And that's an interest, so diversity and inclusion committee with the women's issues as a subcommittee. That sounds really interesting as well. Um, absolutely, and, and I am, um, really excited and um, interested in going back to this and rethinking it and submitting it back to you all as um, and as a committee that's really focused on inclusion. Um, and, and so then um, if you all would accept maybe a new, a new kind of rethinking of this and, um, and then moving forward from there, um, that would be that would be fantastic and I would be excited to take that on. Great. Um, so just uh, do, do, would you like to rework this and bring it back or would you like folks who are interested to respond now and, and help you with this? Well, I think, oh great. Um, so and I see some people um, saying that they're interested in helping. Um, perhaps what we can do then is um, I guess, well, I'm not sure how to do this over Zoom or, or Shana, what the procedure would be fantastic. Um, I, um, 
yeah, I, I see some really fantastic, um, exciting um, additions to the chat. So um, it sounds like rather than a women's issues committee that um, the general sentiment is that um, a, a committee focused on inclusion um, would be would be really the most desirable for everyone. So um, perhaps what I'll do is those who are volunteering in the chat, maybe I can get you all fantastic. Um, maybe we can sort of get together <laughs> um, and put together a proposal together um, and, and then bring it to the body next month. Um, fantastic, so I'll just make sure to get everyone's names um, and we'll figure out a way to communicate and we'll, we'll fashion um, a really strong proposal and, and start working on this as soon as possible. Terrific, thank you very much. And I was watching the chat and it looks like you have more than a handful of folks that really wanna jump in and help out. So thank you very much for bringing this and uh, I'm excited to see it move forward. And, and just as a procedural note, I mean, I, I guess that, you know, if there is going to be significant reworking of the text, then maybe we, maybe this is not the first reading of this. Um, I mean, I guess we could proceed in either direction, but depending on the nature of the tweaks. Um, um, uh, Phil, I think yeah. if, if, the, um, if the proposal is introduced for um, discussion in the university committee, community, mm -hmm. um, it's it doesn't need to be redone as a first reading. Um, whatever whatever folks get, are comfortable with. Things get modified all the time. Does that sure. make sense? Yeah, I guess if it's a if it's a change of substance, I don't want to get too in the weeds of it. But um, one possibility for the um, group that is working on this, the bylaws do provide for the um, creation of ad hoc committees as opposed to standing committees. The bylaws aren't specific around how those are necessarily different. Um, but if if um, you know, getting a group together to talk about issues which might evolve as like an ad hoc committee would make sense as part of the proposal. I, I believe that we have to sort of specify um, when bringing this forward for a vote, um, which kind of committee it might be. Um, so just something to kind of think about in the planning. So I, I would actually like to, um, you know, I don't know how this works in terms of procedure, but I would like to look at this as a, a permanent new addition um, and uh, is there uh, the mechanism where, whereas we provide that this may be a, 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 an issue of substance and waive this second reading, does that apply here? Um, we, I suppose we could. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a proposal as opposed to a resolution. Um, I mean, if, if, if one wanted to feel if one wanted to push this forward quickly um, and in response to needs that might be urgent um, or, or, or very pressing on campus, which I think you could make the case for um, with this um, particular notion, um, I, I guess we could entertain, you know, having a two thirds vote for suspending the rules um, around the second reading and vote on it, um, assuming that that passes. And would that happen now or at the next meeting when it's brought back? Uh, next meeting could be the place where the, a motion would be made to suspend the rules. Okay. So m might I make this suggestion that the folks that are interested move forward on this, we bring it back um, next time, uh, and then we vote to waive the second reading, or would next time be the second reading? I think, I think next time would be the second reading. Okay. So we're, we're definitely within the rules. Great. Do we need to uh, vote on the first reading? No, we have, we have if, when we are done with it, we are done with it. Great. So it looks like we have a game plan. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing the second reading. Um, it will not be at the July, actually, can we use the July retreat? Yes, we can use the, the July retreat as second reading and uh, move on quickly and get the work, the good work going. Great. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. I'll be in touch very soon. Great. Thank you. Um, it might be, it might make sense, I'm sorry, Shana, to, to note a change in the dates for the July retreat. 
Yes. Okay. So um, we all decided that a full day retreat, um, eight hours on a Zoom meeting would make everybody want to pull out their hair. So we're looking at, uh, and we also noted that the date that we had, um, because July 4th falls on a weekend, we may lose a lot of people. So we're looking at two possible two hour sessions on the 14th and the 15th. More, uh, more to come on that as uh, we work with David Rogers, who has, who has agreed to help us with our, um, with our activities for the first day. So more on that. All right, so I am told that the election results are in. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Laura and Jen. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for making this process so smooth and seamless. Uh, Jen and I went through this amazingly quickly because you all follow directions so well. Congratulate yourself, give yourself a little pat on the back. Great job. Um, so thank you all for voting. We, we do have the ballots counted. Um, our chair for the upcoming year will be Shana Hill. Congratulations, Shana. Our vice chair for the upcoming year will be Katie Musgrove. Congra congratulations, Katie. Secretary will be Tiffany Carver. Congratulations, Tiffany. Treasurer will be Ayla Acasio. Congratulations. And finally, our parliamentarian will be Kevin Robinson. Congratulations to you all. Um, it's like it's going to be a terrific year with with you all at the helm. So thank you all for for your service and running. Thank you very much. I have to say I had uh, great anxiety about the voting process, um, but you guys uh, made it seamless. Thank you very much for that. Thank you to the entire team. Um, and I look forward to another great year. So um, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves. I know you are and uh, do the very important, very, very difficult work. And I am told that Jessica is back with us for the wellness update. Thank you. Yes, I am. Thank you for your flexibility. Great to see your faces. Um, so some of my updates, I'll start with this one. Um, we are putting some additional resources, not on the wellness during COVID-19 webpage, but our overall wellness webpage, which can be found at hr.unc.edu, um, just under the benefits tab and click on work life and wellness we're going to be adding some resources by the end of the week on building community together so these are going to be resources to help you understand the problem the impacts and how to help end racial discrimination with that we'll be adding resources as they come to us so if you have any resources that you would like to see on this page please do don't hesitate to send them to me um, and I will get them to Becky and to the communications team for review to add on that new tab that will be on the work life and wellness page. As far as our upcoming sessions, we have one this afternoon at noon on encouraging your kids to be active. Next Wednesday at noon, we have a topic on healthy food choices on the go. We might be a little less on the go. That was planned many months in advance before we knew what kind of environment, what 2020 was gonna look like. But if you'd like to register for those, you can do so on Connect Carolina. And again, all the work life and wellness topics, your managers don't receive notification that you're participating in those. I try to schedule those during the lunch hour. They're often 45 to 60 minutes long. We do have a session also on Tuesday, July 7th, so 7-7, easy to remember, from 12 to 12.30, and that's provided by the Gillings Culture of Health. It is an intro to Qigong class. I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, but I did participate earlier this month, and it's very similar to Tai Chi. It's more focused on um, finding a center and more mindfulness focus than physical activity focus. Um, but if you're interested in that, it is rooted in Chinese medicine and is shown to reduce stress, build energy, improve your immune system, as well as respiratory and cardiovascular system functions as well. So to register for that one, it is not through Connect Carolina, but it is on our Go link, go.unc.edu 
slash make dash time for mindfulness. And I will add that in the um, chat box in a moment to everyone. There you go. And we're still updating our wellness resources on our COVID-19 wellness page. The Qigong class is under the section making time for mindfulness. So do know that we are adding classes and resources as they come to us. I can't say it's as often as weekly anymore, but we are still making those updates. So if you have something you'd like to see on that web page, please don't hesitate to send it to me. And then I know earlier I had to jump off a little bit, and so I didn't get to hear all the winners for the forum awards, but I'm happy to say that this year's Governor's Awards for Excellence nominations were was the most popular one since I've been here over the past three years. We've had eight Carolina employees nominated. We are allowed up to 12, but um, in previous years we've only had two, so I'm ecstatic that we have had eight people nominated. Um, and the different categories that they were nominated in, there were seven categories total. Three categories that people were nominated in was efficiency and innovation, so Susan Cadwell and her team of 17 employees from Information Technology Services were nominated for that, as well as Stephen King from the UNC Reese Innovation Lab. And then the next category was Human Relations. We had two nominations there, Lieutenant James Ellis from the UNC Police, and then Adriani Jablitz. Go. And I'm so sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but I do know you fairly well and you're at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and biggest nominations with public service. So Dewana Jones from the Dean of Students, Claire Lorch, which I heard her name on here as well. She received a nomination as well from the North Carolina Botanical Gardens. William Stursky from the Department of History, and Robert Baskin Cooper from Information Services all received a nomination. So these are nominations that are open to any state employees across North Carolina. So universities as well as state agencies and the winners will be announced by early August. So I look forward to sharing those all with you. Our discounts for the month of June, there are always tons of discounts, but I like to highlight a few. We have a discount off of a Vitamix blender, um, which is 15% off and free shipping if you wanna start making gazpacho or um, smoothies. The code is VITA15 and that will be in work well. And then there are a lot of Father's Day discounts on our Working Advantage site um, on lots of technology gifts, such as computers, Dell, Lenovo, um, Fitbit, cell phones, etc. So I encourage you to check those out. Any questions for me? Any questions for Jessica? That was that was great and a lot. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for being flexible with me. Sure. Flexibility is the name of the game. <laughs> Any questions for Jessica? Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate the updates. Please keep them coming because uh, wellness is so incredibly important right now. Everybody, uh, I think, really needs to um, try to remember that self-care is, is how we keep this going for as long as it takes. So thank you very much. Great. So we have come to the end of the agenda, folks, um, but I have had a request. Uh, Arlene says, wellness classes have been a sanity saver for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I have had a request to talk briefly in the last couple of minutes um, about the resolution that we hope to craft uh, based on the first step of the statement that we released and then read again this morning. So I would, I would like to open it up to the delegate body uh, to talk about what next steps look like for crafting this resolution. Uh, did anybody have any questions about uh, how that process uh, is going to work? Or would anyone like to make comments?
So Shana, I know we sometimes will do um, kind of like subcommittees of people that are interested in kind of coming together to help craft a resolution. Um, as I know, a lot of our personnel issues committee folks um, are pressed for time. So if there's folks that are interested in coming together to help craft a resolution, a resolution, um, and, and wanting to kind of contribute ideas to the next steps um, that the employee forum would like to take, I think it would be great um, maybe if we put that information in the chat. Great. Um, so if you don't feel like um, stating your, your interest for that in this forum today, can you get your name and information, contact information to me, Matt, Katie, and Tiffany, and we will work to form a working group. I would like to do this, um, you know, I would like to sort of say we're starting now and I, I, once again, next week is the executive committee meeting. We really do want to make that a working meeting to start crafting this resolution. And these are action steps. For those of you new, new to the forum, there's a difference between a proclamation and a, and a resolution. A proclamation is making a statement. Um, a resolution is a call to action. And so uh, what we want to do is start a resolution for a call to action and start outlining some of, the, some of our recommendations because we are the advisory body to the chancellor. And I think it's important that the chancellor hear our thoughts and our suggestions. So um, please let us know if you're interested in that work and we welcome, we welcome you to the committee meeting next week and we can do it via Teams, we can do it via email. We do want to connect as many folks as possible who are interested in that important work. Would we maybe want to send the executive committee like information to the delegate body in case they uh, there's folks that want to attend and participate? Sure, I can ask Matt to send out that in, that information. Shana, on a related note, I'm wondering if you maybe want to speak about the email that you sent out from Staff Assembly about the new task force, um, just some additional information surrounding that. Sure, so um, I was really excited to see what happened at the Staff Assembly level, and so for those of you who are not familiar with the Staff Assembly, the Staff Assembly uh, is the body that represents all 17 campuses. We all come together uh, in monthly meetings and uh, quarterly meetings to talk about common issues staff share on a system level. And there are 17 campuses across the state of North Carolina. The staff assembly, the faculty, the staff council and the governing body of students and the staff uh, system level all crafted a joint statement um, it was beautifully written and, uh, and delivered to the chair of the Board of Governors and the interim uh, president, system president, William Roper. And uh, I think it's wonderful to note that I think the, 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 the statement was sent the end of last week and the, the response came uh, Monday, I believe, Monday or Tuesday that um, they received the statement um, and they were creating, there was already a task force on equity and all three leadership uh, members was asked to join the task force. Uh, that was uh, to me a, a beautiful example of how unity works when people come together and, and do the hard work, uh, they, they actually get a seat at the table. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to read the email that I sent out, there is the joint statement by the staff, faculty, and student organizations, and the response by the interim president, William Roper, and the chair of the Board of Governors, Randy Ramsey. So please take a look at that. Um, I think that might help guide what we do uh, and how we do it. I would love for us to partner, continue partnering with faculty council on this campus. They have been incredibly supportive to us, and I know they have a new chair uh, who I will be reaching out to um, and, and hopefully we can do something similar on this campus. Any thoughts or discussion about that? Thank you for sharing it, Shana. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I'd seen that happen. Uh, I, was, I was pretty blown away by it.
Any other thoughts or comments by the body? We have a few minutes. Question is, when do we declare which committees we would like to be involved in? That generally happens uh, at, the, at the retreat, which will happen next month. However, if you know of a committee you want to be on, send that information to Matt Banks and he will connect you with the current chair of that committee. Uh, we don't have to wait until the retreat to get that, uh, to get that going. Okay. Um, Matt, I had a question sent to me separately. Are we sending out certificates to the uh, Peer Recognition Award winners this year? I know that things are so different this year. I know we usually do. Um, but I didn't know really how to answer the question. Uh, I haven't um, been, a, I don't have a printer at home and I haven't gone in the office except for a brief time to help with the blood drive supplies. Uh, so I would mail them out once I'm able to print them. Okay. So uh, it, it'll, there'll be a delay of some amount of time. There is, uh, Greg would like to make one short announcement. Greg, are you with us? I'm here. Um, this is timely based on one of the previous questions, but it's something I intended to pull out on the consent agenda and didn't chime in quickly enough. Just wanted to note that the communications and public relations committee uh, were discussing in our last meeting, uh, especially since time will be probably a little shorter and things will be more uh, more chaotic during our uh, our upcoming retreat that letting people know uh, information about the committees that they can join may be streamlined a little bit uh, by us uh, sending out a guide to new delegates on what the committees do. So uh, we're gonna put together a little guide just to send out to the new delegates. Um, so if you are in charge of a committee, uh, please send me a little spiel or bio or, you know, whatever pitch you like. Uh, I think I'm going to target the 19th, so maybe next Friday. Um, and we'll get together a little guide that may help new delegates figure out which committees they want to join before we actually have the retreat. So just wanted to note that. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, and I, there is a request from Adriani. Are you on? Can you share with us? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who sent in the statements from their units or departments regarding anti-Black violence that we featured on our homepage. Um, and if you haven't sent one in yet and there is a statement that you'd like to share with the campus, please do send it to me at, uh, at my email address, A-D-R-I-G-I-B-I. -I -I. I'll, I'll type it out for you. Um, and uh, um, yeah, we continue to get a lot of responses about that. This is an issue that's gonna you know, be at the forefront for a very long time, especially for our office for diversity and inclusion. And, um, and we really welcome everybody's participation. And, and if there's anything that you'd like to see put on there, there's also resources and there's um, a place where you can um, provide uh, your comments called Your Voice Matters. So if you take a look at the website, um, see that there's anything that you want to add that represents what your department is doing, please do send it to me and, and I'll do my best to, to share that with everyone. Great, thank you. And uh, just a, a question, because I'm interested, are those comments being shared that people are sharing anonymously? So uh, one of the questions we ask on the forum is, are you willing to share your comments? Because we wouldn't want to do that without permission. And we haven't yet decided exactly how we're going to use it, whether it will be a town hall or some other kind of panel discussion or what. That's something that we're working on right now, but we're so, we're so in the middle of it right now that, that we're, we're still trying to pull together all the resources and figure out what the plan is next. So I'll let you know as soon as I know. Please do. Yeah. Great. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Anybody else like to share what's going on in their areas? We have three more minutes. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for a wonderful oh, meeting. Hey, hang on. 
Uh huh. China, sorry, this is Tiffany. Okay. Um, so guys, if you can, if you are calling in and you're a delegate, can you please email me your um, your name and information so that we know you attended? Because that won't show up, I don't think, on the attendance list. Um, and I was unable to make an attendance list today <laughs> because I'm out and about. But if the, the folks that are calling in could email me, that'd be great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Any last last minute thoughts? All right, everybody. Thank you very much for a wonderful meeting. I look forward to the, tr the retreat next month and uh, the continued hard work in the coming year. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Bye-bye.